The chip is actually underneath. With most criminal cases now including digital evidence such as email, voicemail, hard drives and digital phones, a workforce skilled in extracting that evidence is in high demand. From a lab point of view, we've done work for 20 plus states as well as Utah. And from a training point of view, we've trained all the way from Australia, uh, Thailand, uh, the UK, uh, uh, mostly Western Europe. At Dixie State University's Digital Forensics Crime Lab, students are learning how to retrieve information from small devices such as cell phones and laptops. The process of chip-off forensics uses high-intensity light and heat, allowing the removal of the flash memory card so that data stored inside can be obtained. Uh, the heat gets the chip off the board and then um, it's just getting it hot enough to melt that adhesive that sticks all those parts to the board. After you take that little chip off of the board, you'd then put it in a card reader into the computers that we have here at the lab and then kind of parse through the data, reading it in its raw format. We still do chip off. We, there are still phones out there and there are still other um, electronics that we get that need chip off. But it's, we're really trying to evolve again as far as some of the new tools that, that we use to do it. The process of hacking into other electronic devices like game consoles can also help law enforcement find hidden files. Um, with gaming devices, it's also important because in chat rooms, there could be grooming or other important things that people need to know of, and we could get that information off of it. So we're seeing if the easier ways to extract that information and data with or if it's easier to just go up to the cloud. The Digital Forensic Crime Lab is celebrating 10 years in partnering with police not only in Utah, but across the globe. The lab has grown from working on 18 cases in its first year to now averaging 350 to 400 cases a year, specializing in data retrieval. Most are still, I'd say over 90% are still phones, but we now do automobile forensics. Um, if you spoke with one of our interns, we're doing gaming console forensics now, um, Apple TV forensics, so we're, we're expanding. We are still primarily small device, cell phones, iPads, things like that, but it's expanding. During an open house, police detectives said the service is priceless in investigations. People from all over the country send their stuff here and it's in our backyard. So. Uh, we've, we've hosted trainings where people come here and they've asked us to come and see the lab because they've only heard about it. And so uh, this is critical. And then to have that trust built where we can bring things here and not have to worry about whether it's going to be compromised is invaluable. This lab has been used to solve criminal cases from all over, including well-known high-profile cases. They sent Aaron Hernandez's phone here and they did the chip-off program. And they're the ones that extracted all the data to help with the conviction of that. And I thought... Man, here in St. George, Utah, to have that technology, and nobody else has that technology worldwide. Students who are studying in the criminal justice field with an emphasis in criminology and digital defense and security say this education is not only unique, but will serve them well in their future careers. I um, kind of look into the criminal justice world in the sense of criminal minds and criminal behavior and kind of like how criminals play into society and why they do what they do. My plans are actually to go into the Air Force and hopefully join OSI and be a special investigator. And if that doesn't work out, because life is life, I would love to do digital forensics as a career. It's very interesting and it's constantly changing and keeping me on my toes. And this year, two high school students are interns at the crime lab. They are studying different topics related to helping solve crimes. I'm focusing on 3D facial reconstruction because I'm interested in forensic anthropology, which deals a lot with skeletal remains and reconstructions. It's used for um, missing persons sometimes. They can do like age progressions for when children go missing using the same principle. It's also used for identification when they find uh, skeletal remains. This was a, wasn't 3D, it was an artist that um, got a picture of the skull and made a rendition. And as you can see, it was very close, so they were able to identify her. The goal, like, um, for me is to write a research paper on 3D blood spatter, like, analysts, and so that's, like, 
there's a ton of softwares and programs that are used to like calculate the, the trajectory um, area of origin and stuff like that and area of uncertainty with blood spatter. And so it's just kind of like using that and seeing how that how much more accurate that is than man-made or if there is a difference. And from my research so far, I've found that the generated software is usually always more accurate than man-made methods. Technology is everything now. So yeah, it's great. I mean, to have high school seniors here working alongside Dixie students, alongside police departments, alongside our scientists here. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. From Dixie State University, Melissa Anderson, Community Education News. It's not